Hi, my name is Nikki Tran. Today is March 5th, 2011. I'm interviewing Boy Dan Kwa at the Saigon Radio Station in Houston, Texas for the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation 500 Oral History Project. What is your name, where and when were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, my name, uh, when I was born, it was given as Boy Dan Kwa and then when we came over United States and immigrate over, and we changed our name to uh, Scott Boyd. Uh, when I became a U.S. citizen, um, I arrived here in 1975 uh, as part of basically a uh, migration of uh, Vietnamese after the fall of Saigon. Um, I have uh, eight brothers and sisters, uh, uh, so we have ten in the family. And we, uh, after the fall of Saigon in April 1975. Uh, we migrate over as part of the uh, U.S. fleet over in the uh, Philippines. My first destination was uh, in the Philippines at Subic Bay. And from then on, they moved us over to Wake Island. And uh, Wake Island was set up for basically the, uh, the immigrants and uh, part of the Vietnamese migration. Uh, we were the first family refugee there on Wake Island. Most of the people was already in uh, Guam which was part of the first migration. And then uh, afterward, uh, as people arrived to Wake Island, they basically moved us to uh, Indian Tower Gap, which is part of the military base in the U.S. From there, uh, uh, we get sponsored from all over the country. But because my family is so big, 10 people, nobody wants to sponsor us. This is too many. So uh, during that time, there was a, a Catholic church uh, up in New York, and it's a small town called in Indicott, New York. Uh, basically, they sponsor us. Uh, there was nine of us. One of my sister was uh, all responsible by another family to go to uh, a college up in Massachusetts. So there was nine of us left. So they sponsor, sponsor us over to, uh, to Indicott, New York. Uh, when we arrived, there was no one there. There was no Vietnamese whatsoever. New country, new place, uh, new town, uh, different people. Uh, and when you get out, uh, the weather was too cold. Uh, so pretty much everything is new. The environment is new. Uh, for us, it was something that of a learning process. So as we arrived there, pretty much most of the uh, people around uh, in the town was uh, white. Basically, this is part of northern uh, U.S. Uh, but there was no Vietnamese. Uh, the, the second family that arrived uh, in that part of town was really my grandmother. Uh, and the reason being is uh, we were able to find another church. It was, it was a Baptist church that sponsored part of my other family, which is my grandmother's side of the family. Uh, so that was the second family. And afterward, there was about a few more, probably about three or four more other family that arrived. But still, it was small enough that you know we were so close as like a close knit community. But every time you walk out and you hear somebody speak Vietnamese, it was like a blessing in disguise because you you know rarely do you hear anybody speak Vietnamese. And then when they do speak us, to us in English, no one would understand. So uh, pretty much it was like you know totally uh, new alienated. So. But the community really embraces because there really isn't that many Vietnamese uh, there at that town. So when we go to the movie theater, we get in for free. Pizza was new. Pizza was something that 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 you know you never seen before. And at that time, they would sell by the slice. I remember it was like 15 cent per slice. You know, it was cheap. It was something new. But it was it was, it was our first time taste of, of what pizza was like. But the food was new, and to even get like a bag of rice was complicated. There's no Chinese grocery store. There was no Asian store. There's no uh, uh, any kind of Asian food whatsoever. There wasn't even a Chinese restaurant back then. So to even get a taste of Vietnamese food or Asian food was like you know something imagine of it uh, being something like a a gift. So to stay there a while, you know, we try to gather up as much of our culture as possible. But also there's a clash of culture too because sometimes we do things that are pretty much new or maybe different from 
you know, the people uh, in, the, in the small town. In hindsight, when you look back, what you see is, is some of the things you do is kind of weird. But that's part of, you know, learning process. So as you learn that, you know, things that you did before during that period, you kind of question, say, why did, why did I do it in the first place? Um, but, you know, that's part of the learning process. And you, you, you learn that uh, what they give you, you know, it's, it's just really a blessing. So it's, it's really a, a, a deep feeling and you deep, deep appreciation for what they're giving you. Can you give us an example of like a childhood memory that you had in Vietnam and say another how it was different when you moved to New York? My memory of Vietnam was uh, somewhat very little, but it's, in, it's, it's impact a lot on how uh, basically as far as what I believe in today. Um, April 1975, uh, during the fall of Saigon, I remember specifically of the uh, basically all the uh, explosion around surrounding the uh, town. Uh, you can hear the sound, you can hear the uh, explosion going on. And my memory of it is basically uh, to uh, to hide under the uh, one of the uh, bed because that's all you, that's all you can do. Uh, you see people uh, running around, and you, you saw uh, all of these military uh, vehicle uh, going all different direction, but you don't know where they're heading. Uh, you hear rumor of, uh, of people running into the embassy. You, you would hear a rumor of people uh, driving to the airport. Uh, it was chaotic. Uh, it was part of one of those moments that you, you, can't, you, know, you can't forget because it's really part of you, and it's really what the foundation that set you as a person today. If you relive those moments, you appreciate you know, all the things that was given to you because at that specific moment in time, my family lost everything. We lost our house, we lost our, 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 the people around us, we lost our culture, we lost everything. So at that specific moment, to relive it to, is to understand, to start over. But with that in mind, you appreciate that what you lost, you can rebuild again. And as for today, I can see now the, the culture of the restaurants, the, uh, and then you can walk down, down the street today and hear people speaking Vietnamese, and, and it's like home. Uh, of course, it's a different feeling uh, now that if you get a chance to go back, because no matter how you feel, you still get a sense of being home if you get a chance to go back, because that's where you came from. And that's why you always going to have to remember that's your motherland. And you're going to have to get that feeling that once you get arrive at that airport, you get, you get a deep sense of coming home. But that's being part of reliving at that moment. But as far as the war, I remember the airplanes uh, uh, on high sea crashing down on the, uh, on the open sea because they didn't have a place to dock it on the ship. So they will push it out into the sea and kind of like throw it as trash down in the open sea. And then uh, I will remember uh, where we would be uh, in one of the barge. Actually, it's a barge. It's kind of like a garbage barge. But I, in hindsight, you can see the reason behind it is that uh, it's a place that can carry a lot of people. But at that moment, when we uh, able to find a barge and to get on the barge and, and stay on it, they would pull us out into uh, uh, open sea water. And people were crying and people were uh, screaming, saying that, you know, uh, the American people left us here alone and the Navy and the military is leaving us out here to die. We don't have any food. Because you have to remember, a barge doesn't have, uh, it's not like a ship, it's just a plain uh, floating vessel that has nothing on it. So people were screaming, jumping, and people were crying. We had to get rainwater to drink, and we were fortunate enough to bring some uh, of the ramen noodle. So we ate dry because we don't have any cooking utensil. And there was rumors spreading around that where there was one of the barges that flipped over. I think it was barge number four that flipped over. And um, you can hear baby crying. And, uh, and as far as for myself, we would be sitting there hopelessly just in open water. But you can feel the, 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 you know, the people are afraid because you, here you are in open water, there's no ship in sight, 
and here you're floating in the open water without anybody helping you. So it's really hopeless. But then in hindsight, when you look back, I guess the mentality at that time of the, uh, of the Navy was to pull us out into international water to basically to keep us safe. In the meantime, they gather up the, the resource to start to bring us uh, onto the ship. But that's part of the memory that you, can, you cannot forget. And uh, uh, I want to transfer and, and relay that his, history back to my children so that they can at least understand what's going through uh, at that time and moment. Because reading history is one thing, but living through it is really something else. It's those memories that you know you can't forget, and it's really bring out the person in you. Um, do you can you tell us a little bit about how your family felt, like your mother and father, and all your other brothers and sisters, if you um, were the oldest or the youngest? I was near the youngest um, when I when we came over. The only person that was uh, heading the college was my uh, eldest sister, which she was sponsored one of the family to Massachusetts. But um, as part of big family, uh, we we tend to be grouped together. We, we stay close together. Uh, even today, we live in one I would say a compound because it's, that's the only way, best way to describe it. But uh, my father bought a partial land, about ten acres, and we all live on that partial land. And we all have different houses and subdivision in that partial land. Uh, the street is even named after uh, um, my family last name, so it's a treasure that we able to keep the family together. But as a big family coming to this community, it's a, really an asset. Uh, I mean, you you live in a country where uh, relationship among family members can be distant because of the the, the distance of the states. You you recognize that you know having a big family close together will bring much closer but uh, at that time my, my father was uh, in the military and he was a lieutenant colonel pretty much you know we know that if he was left behind he's gonna they're gonna arrest him they're gonna, I don't know if they're gonna kill him or they put him in concentration camp or whatever but at that time I can I have never felt my father being so much afraid uh, Except for that time when it, you know he realized that everything was falling down, and and I can feel that he's hope, hopelessly not being able to do anything about it. Uh, you can feel the frustration of not being able to find where to go, what to do, where should I take my kids now, where should I take my family now. So it was really by accident that we found this uh, this barge that we were able to get on because we saw everybody climbing on it. But my family came from the north, which is uh, back in 1954 was really uh, anti-communist. Um, so we moved to the south. So having known that part of the history, when it happened in 1975, the migration of the northern people are much more tremendous than the southerner. Most southerner doesn't haven't seen uh, the uh, you know the killings and haven't seen the uh, the atrocity in the north. So they felt a sense that, okay, nothing's going to happen, the country's the same, so they stay behind. So if you notice the 1975 migration, most of them are from northern uh, Vietnam. Uh, the ethnicity is because of the fact that they are from the north. They already uh, basically uh, uh, gone through the process of the communists already, so they understand what it means to be staying behind. So the 1975 wave uh, of, the, um, uh, of the immigration are mostly uh, northerners. Uh, and my family be part of Northern, we were so scared and afraid that, uh, you know, we just migrated in my family. My, my, my dad basically just find whatever he can just to, you know, take us out of the country, knowing that, you know, eventually it's going to fall to the communists. Um, where were you on April 30th, 1975, or do you remember anything about that day specifically? I was in Saigon. My uh, hometown was really... Uh, uh, a market called Cha Ong Ta, uh, and uh, it's really um, Saigon. It seems to be big, but it's not really that big. It, it's small. Um, it's a small city, uh, but part of that town uh, at the end of the street is my uh, elementary school. It's a private school, and um, um, you know, at the time when it happened, I was at home. I remember uh, that uh, my uh, father was uh, was uh, sitting there hopelessly 
I guess he was probably wondering what he needs to do. Uh, my mother, uh, luckily, about a month before it happened, she already stopped packing us each, uh, uh, I would call a back backpack or maybe a back sack. And she would uh, basically sew it into the side of the back sack. Uh, each of us maybe about maybe half an ounce, I don't know how many ounces of gold in there, but she gave us each a little bit piece of gold on the side of the, back, of the uh, backpack. And she would uh, put in each of those backpacks some clothing, especially the boys. Uh, and then there's some uh, dry rice. And I questioned her, I said, well, what are you doing? And her response was, in the event that we we'll need to uh, have to move or run away, then one option would be to, to, you know, to go into the jungle. And so she packed each of us with a backpack uh, filled up with rice, with uh, ramen noodle, with some clothing, with some, uh, some uh, leaflets and uh, gold, so that if we go into the jungle, at least we have some way of uh, living. I didn't understand that at first, but uh, uh, recognizing that there was something going on. There was talk about uh, finding ship, there was talk about finding, uh, going to the airport. So it, re it really was chaotic, but um, the one thing I remember in during April 1975 was uh, all the shelling and the explosion that's going on. Uh, the family next to our house, they were killed uh, of the explosion. So it was right next to, uh, uh, next to us. And so I can see all the chaotic going on. Um, but to really feel of, you know, being afraid, you know, you got to, you got to be there at that moment. But even at that young age, you know, I recognize how much that my, my parent was afraid of. And I can feel the, you know, the frustration of not being able to find any other way out. And it, like I said, it was by chance that we found a, a way to get out. Um, did you ever come any, into contact with any American soldiers? Or um, I know you said your, uh, some people's opinions about them, but what were your opinions of the American soldiers? The American soldier at that time, my only uh, recollection was at the uh, camp, and this was at Subic Bay. Uh, when we got on uh, on the ship, my recollection uh, from the barge, and then they picked us up from the barge and they got us on the ship. I was on, my family was on the second deck, uh, and there wasn't any, uh, you know, like bedroom. We would all be laying on top of the deck. Uh, the only uh, thing that covers from the sun was like a tarp, and we used a fabric to tarp. Below the deck, there was probably a thousand of people below the deck, and was below. So if you walk on the deck, you literally have to step on other people. And um, I remember seeing a guy got his handcuff on top of the uh, third deck of the ship, and and my father explained to me the reason he got handcuffed was because he drank milk. I couldn't understand at first why he got handcuffed, but I remember that uh, milk was only provided for the children. My best guess would be that he probably drank the milk that was designated for the children on the, uh, on the uh, ship, and therefore they just handcuffed him as an example so that uh, uh, basically to save the milk for the children. Uh, that was something that is still in my mind today. I still can picture of him being handcuffed. Uh, I also be able to picture people on the bottom deck laying all across. Uh, instead of carrying cargo, they carry people. So just imagine all this cargo, replace it by people lying all over the place. Uh, it's traumatic. Um, by the time we got to Subic Bay, that was when I first uh, seen uh, probably U.S. Uh, servicemen. Um, they gave us orange and apple, uh, which is common here, but it was heaven to us. Coca-Cola was heaven. We don't get Coke. Um, and to to have been given uh, uh, just a, you know as much as you can drink Coke and, and, and all the oranges and apples, and you know, it really was heaven. So Subic Bay was the first destination, and that was the first time when I saw the servicemen. Their treatment of uh, of all the people at the refugee was very friendly and very courteous. I, you know, I have to really appreciate all the things they've done. Um, and to say that, you know, 
what have we received from that that time? You cannot contemplate what they have given to us. I mean, it's a lot. To even set up the camp, to even give, you know, provide food, uh, breakfast, lunch, and, and, and dinner was, was something that they don't have to do, but they did it anyway, and to appreciate that. But the one thing you can see is that coming from a country that doesn't have that much food, and to see you eat breakfast and lunch and, and, and dinner, and all the buffet food you can eat, that is heaven for me as at that age. But I guess for uh, some of uh, my parents and probably some of the older folks was the food probably not something they would like to eat. I mean, you, you start with f fried chicken and hamburgers, probably not something they like to eat. But that's my memory of the servicemen. And then when we got to the camp, there was a lot of servicemen too. Uh, we learned different trades. We learned how to make things. But um, in in recollect, you know, recalling all the time I met with them, it's all been good and it's all been something that I always appreciate. So even today when I see them, I have to appreciate what they've done, you know. I don't know how the mentality of the servicemen today now, I hope it's the same, but back then it was really humanitarian and they really opened their arms for us. Um, can you kind of make a timeline of everything in between when you were on the barge and then from, um, got all the way to New York? Yeah, you know, April uh, 28, 1975 was the day that uh, really it happened. We were on the barge uh, most of the time up until around seven days. And uh, there were ships that provided something. I guess they would figure that maybe uh, uh, with rainwater, we okay. And luckily there was rainwater. That's, that's how we collect the water to drink. Um, but by the time we got on the uh, Super Bay, it was already around um, May 5th, okay, or May 8th. I don't remember the exact date. But uh, we stayed there for a while, probably about a week or maybe two weeks or so. Uh, Philippines was beautiful. Uh, you get to watch, you get to watch movie outside every day, and then the uh, the time spent on pretty much morning. We line up to go eat uh, breakfast. Uh, we play around a little bit. Lunch time, we go eat lunch, play around a little bit, and then we go eat dinner. And after dinner, we all hang around the uh, movie, and they will show a movie outside in the open field. Luckily, there was no mosquito, but um, but that's pretty much the day in and day out on the Philippines. Uh, after that, they would talk about uh, moving us to Guam, but then Guam was already filling up. Um, I don't know how the process was as far as, um, as basically um, uh, who goes first and who goes last, but pretty much every day we would go out and try to look at the list from the Red Cross to see if any of our family members made it. My grandmother was the one that we worry about. My uh, uncle was behind with my grandmother, so uh, we were looking for his name. His wife, which is my aunt, was with us. So actually in our family, at that time when we were at Subic Bay, it was my, my family, which is 10 people, my aunt and, uh, and her children, and then her sister-in-law too. So there was really three women and one man. I kind of feel bad about my, my dad having to take care of them, but I guess at that time that he has to. So a lot of people look, us, look upon us as, having, as him having multiple wives. So he's kind of embarrassed at that, but it, it's kind of funny when you think about it because, you know, when you see a man with three women and then all those little children hanging around behind you, you kind of figure maybe he has three wives. But really, it's, it's, it's my family, my aunt's family, and, and uh, my aunt's sister-in-law. So every day they would go and look for my grandmother's name, and they would go and, uh, and look for uh, her husband's name, which is my, my uncle, and uh, to see if they can uh, spot the name. And so that's pretty much the day in and day out of uh, on Philippines on the Subic Bay. Then when they moved us to um, to Wake Island, Wake Island was a military um, uh, island. <clears throat> it's a small island. Uh, there was already a military camp there. There's a church there. I'm I'm Catholic, so uh, that's the first thing we did. And and uh, we were really the first family there. No one was there. And there wasn't much there. Really, it was empty. It was really um, kind of scary in a way. I mean, I can hear my sister saying that it's, there's a lot of ghosts here because people died in World War II and stuff like that. But i never seen any. But when we first arrived, uh, the camp was already set up. Um, 
we were able to find some uh, sweet potato in the back of the camp, and it was it was great. I think it was the best food ever. I mean, having eaten all the uh, American food, and then all of a sudden you have sweet potato, and we would eat it uh, raw, and it actually was really good. Uh, and then with the vegetable from the, with the plants from the uh, from the sweet potato, we would cook soup. Okay. So it was a lot of memories there, and then we stayed there for a, a while before they moved us to uh, Indian Town Gap, which is also a military camp. Military camp. We stayed there uh, for several months before we found a sponsor to New York. Like I said, my family was very large, 10 people in the family. Uh, we didn't have uh, much sponsor. No one wants to sponsor 10 people, it's too much. Uh, luckily, uh, uh, participating in the Mass in the church, we met one of the sisters there. It was an American sister. Uh, her name was Sister uh, Matthew. And uh, and she was able to make contact with one of the church in New York, uh, a town called Endicott, New York, very small town. Uh, apparently, the church basically gathered up the congregation and, and, and able to sponsor, agreed to sponsor one large family. Uh, when we arrived, they gave us a house uh, to live in. It was a small house. Uh, we stayed there for a while. Uh, didn't know much, but like I said, the, the one thing I missed the most was the cooking. There was no fish sauce. There was no rice. So we keep on begging for rice. They couldn't understand why. But they gave they gave us a lot of bread. They gave us a lot of peanut butter and jelly, and gave us a lot of of. Uh, meat. I mean, there's a lot of food. I mean, people were giving food. People were giving us toys and people were giving everything. I mean, this was like paradise. I mean, coming from a, a small country. But what they gave us, what's lacking was the really the ethnic food that we miss. So we didn't have, we didn't have rice, we didn't have a uh, fish sauce. Uh, there was no Asian store inside. Uh, luckily, uh, my sister met uh, a priest. Uh, the priest's name is John Tabor. He speaks perfect Vietnamese. All right. Uh, you look at him. He's he's Caucasian. He's white, and you would not tell him apart from anything else. But he speaks perfect Vietnamese. All right. He met us, and then he would said, uh, "I know a place that we can get stuff." So he would uh, take us in his uh, Volkswagen uh, Bugs. It's a small Volkswagen. And he would drove us all the way to Pennsylvania. So from New York to Pennsylvania is about two and a half hours. He would buy a box of fish sauce, yeah, just to carry home because I don't know whether because it's for us, it's for him because he wanted to. But uh, we would buy some rice and some fish sauce, and he would drove all the way back to New York so that we could have some home cooking. Well, one of the things I remember was one of the bottles broke halfway, so basically his car smelled like fish sauce. Okay. Uh, we kind of feel sorry. He said, "You know, I'm sorry, Father. I mean, you, when you know, the fish are broken in your car." He said, ah, "Don't worry. That's like perfume for me." So for him, it's really something that he likes too. Uh, those are the stories we remember. And then, you know, some of the mass as the fam, this more family arrive, uh, we have a small congregation, maybe about less than ten family. But we do have mass service. We have a uh, uh, Vietnamese mass. There was a priest that was Vietnamese that came later. Uh, we met him, and then he has he would have mass service, but then we would have it over at uh, a, a bigger town called Binghamton, which is, I believe, it's a, it's a bigger town in New York. Um, so we would drive there, and I would remember all the time we stayed there. Each weekend, my dad would take us, drive us uh, around uh, to go picnic. Uh, we have no idea what we're doing, but nothing to do. Uh, the one memories I remember, and this was something that. Uh, that I will never forget was my mom came home crying one time and she would be crying and I remember my dad was uh, talking to her and I remember my sis was asking her and one of the things they were saying is why is she crying and she said well they took her to uh, a welfare uh, line they asked her to stand in place to uh, get welfare and she cried she said I don't want welfare just give me a job I don't want welfare and at the time, they said you need it because you came over. You need you need assistant. You need public assistant, and you need uh, you need to have uh, welfare. And she said, No, I'm not going to get welfare. I can I have I can work. I can do that. So she will be crying all the way home, and she would not adamantly accept any welfare whatsoever. 
So they finally found her a job of folding clothes at probably one of the laundry mat. She was making like a dollar twenty-five an hour at the time. My dad was able to make around two fifty at the time, two twenty-five to be exact. And we able to get enough money. And then uh, I would remember that uh, the church gave us a car. It was an old car. It's a green car, but it's a big car now. And you know we would be driving around. Uh, my first remembrance of that city was when we arrived at the airport. One of the sisters took us in the, uh, uh, into the, the, one of the car, and, and I was sitting in the back with my sister, and, and, and one of my sisters was saying, this car is so cool. Every time she makes a turn, it turns left, and, and when the signal turns right, she turns right. Well, we know back in 75 they didn't have GPS. But we didn't know better. So one of my sisters, who's a smart aleck all the time, she said, oh, you don't know anything. You, you, that's, this car has already had built in. All she has to do is type in the, the street address, and it tells you which direction to point left and right. So when the arrow turned right, she turned right. When the arrow turned left, she turned her left. So you know, we all said, wow, this is cool. This, this, that's what US is about. So we thought she was smart. We didn't know that she was just being a smart aleck. But now we know they can do it with GPS. But back then, those light signal was a way of telling us to turn left or right. So when we finally got a car, uh, that was the first thing I tried to notice. It was, why did it turn left and why did it turn right? And I realized that it was the signal that it got turned left and turn right. So that was something that new for me to learn. Uh, and then you have to learn how to walk on ice because it was so cold. And it was bad, but when we look out the window and I saw my dad slipping down the slope of ice, we would be laughing inside the house. We didn't realize how much it hurt him, but we would be laughing and he would get so mad, but the ice would be covering all over the place and it would be snowing. And so those are the experiences that you, know, you, you, you remember. And then afterward, uh, pretty much you know, with the car, he would take us to go picnic each uh, weekend. And because you know, there's not much to do during the week. Uh, we didn't come down here to, the US, uh, to the Houston, Texas until about almost a year later, and that was by uh, by his friend who was who arrived here and said that there's more work here. But the one thing that instilled in me through these years was the fact that seeing my mom cry because she didn't want to accept welfare. I understand the you know the process of of people being poor and have to accept the welfare. But I think because of that, it makes you strive harder to work harder to make a better living, rather than just to be basically to accept what they give you. But those memories, it will stay with me, and I hope I can share that with my, my, my children so that they can you know, go and remember what I have been through. So when you moved to um, Houston, how, how old were you then? I was uh, around nine, turning 10 at that time. And uh, when we arrived here, my, my, my father came down here first. Uh, he saved up $100. And I remember that was a lot of money. $100 was a lot of money. So with the $100, with the car that the, the, the church gave to us, uh, he has to pick which one of them, my brother and sister to go along with him. And you guess it, it's one of my smart Alex sister. She's the smartest one in the house. So she gets to go, even though she was uh, under 18, but she's the smartest one in the house. And then my, uh, my older brother, because you know, we normally look up to the, uh, the elder brother as being part of the family, uh, being taking care of the family. So it was him, my, uh, my sister, and my, uh, my brother. Three of them got in the car and drove from New York down to uh, Houston, Texas. And actually it was in Houston, Texas. It was Texas City. That was our first city. Uh, $100 in his pocket. He drove down halfway down to Charlotte, uh, uh, his car broke down with a muffler. He didn't sleep at the Henry Hotel because he couldn't afford it. So they slept in the car, they slept at the uh, McDonald's, and they slept at the uh, gas station. But his car broke down, the muffler broke down. He was able to find uh, a person. Uh, he was black, he's a black American person. He helped out uh, putting uh, the muffler back together, and he charged my dad a dollar twenty-five. Okay, so with a hundred dollar and then a dollar twenty five for the the muffler, and then he finally decided that it's time to stay overnight because they couldn't fix it right away, so he has to pay twelve dollars for a motel. I don't know what motel was uh, maybe motel six back then I don't know when, but 
he spent about 12 bucks and then he drove all the way down to Texas City. When he got here, he stayed with his friend. And the first thing he did was uh, they gave him a, a, a store to manage. Actually, he didn't manage it, but he worked at the store to learn the process. I remember the name because I went out there and helped him a lot. Uh, the store was a Utotem store. Uh, back then, there was a lot of Utotem. And uh, he started working there, and then he slept there at night. Uh, we would go to school, and after school, I would go out and help him stock the, the, the grocery store. And after a while, the, uh, I guess the supervisor of the district assigned him a store, so he became manager of the store. And from that, uh, uh, basically, he just worked from the store. But there was one condition in there that they don't allow you to manage two stores. So in a way, he has to, he has to be a manager of one store, and then my mom has to be manager of the other store, but then they would shift. shift. He would work like 6 o'clock in the morning on one store, uh, I guess because of overtime. I didn't understand the law back then, but I guess overtime, they didn't want you to work too much an hour. He worked six, from 6 to about 12 uh, noon. Then he would go to the other store, and my mom would move from the other store from 6 to 12 to the second store, and he would shift. So he became her employee in the other store, and she became his employee on this store. And that was something that, uh, you know, they switched back and forth, and then uh, they closed the store around 11. So they sleep there, and they would wake up in the morning and eat there. And I remember their food was, was really a cup of noodle. That's pretty much it. Uh, it's all a cup of noodle, and it's uh, uh, whatever they can find the store to eat. And they live, they, they work. They stay at the store. We would come down there after school and help them. And then uh, there was one time um, they were working, and because they didn't know any better, they didn't know about stealing and stuff. So they would watch people, you know, stealing in the store. So they they're afraid that the people are going to steal. So that some of the kids are going to steal. So one way they approach it is that when you ask for stuff in their back, they would have a stick and they would point it into a back and they say, "Which one you want?" And then when you stop, she would reach in the back and she would grab maybe a cigarette or something, and then, then she would give it to the, the, the customer because she's afraid to turn around and she would lose the stuff, uh, even though it's not her store. But she really was afraid of losing the job, so she really, really put the time and effort into protecting the store. And then, uh, and then I remember he would buy this big old knife. It's probably one of those hunting knives. My guess would be about an 18-inch knife or maybe a 16-inch knife. And and I and I remember we were talking. About, I said, "Why do you need a knife?" He said, "Yeah, we need it whenever they come rob us." Well, they did. One one day, somebody came and robbed us, right? And the guy came out and said, "Give me your money," right? So the the idea was, if you have a bigger knife, they they wouldn't steal from you. So back then there was no gun, so he would pull out a knife. He said, "Give me the money," and then we would, we would pull out this bigger knife, and then you know they said, uh, "Go away," and they would go away. So that's how you protect the store. So the, the the big knife back then was to protect the store. And then, you know, in the evening I would go out there and help them to restock the store and, and to build up, and that was their first job. And uh, and then we lived in Texas City for a while, uh, working at a grocery store, and that's how we learned the trade, we learned the business, we learned what it takes to, to run the store. And you told them it was the first store that we worked in, and then we migrate to 7-Eleven because they pay a little bit higher. 7-Eleven was like the cream of the crop job, okay? If you work at 7-Eleven, that means you have it made because they pay more. Uh, and then uh, after 7-Eleven, uh, my dad bought the first store. Uh, the store. It was closed by Plantation. Back then, Plantation, it was Utotem, uh, Plantation, and 7-Eleven, uh, and Shamrock uh, Diamond Station, which those are the four major uh, players in the uh, grocery business. But after Plantation shut down, they sold a lot of their store. And my dad was fortunate enough to buy one of the first plantation stores that closed down. And we built up, you know, our whole family and our business around that, just uh, buying store and building it up. So I was raised up working since little. And uh, I remember we even get a second job uh, uh, through one of the priests there that said, that, do you want to work at night? And my dad said, yeah, give us work and we'll work. So he would take on the job and then he would uh, give it to us. And, and at that time, it was like we go to school, we went to school, and then we come home. And like about eight o'clock, he was pick us up from home, drove drove us to one of the buildings that we contract with. Didn't know any better what it was. Uh, apparently, it was a manufacturing uh, building. We would go in there, we would clean bathroom. Uh, you know, we clean the you know the toilet and clean, pick up the trash and all that stuff. And 
and then by around nine o'clock he would come and pick us up and we'd go home. So that was an extra income for him. So in a way, that's a part of helping. But uh, like I said, those are the things that build character. You, you start cleaning restroom and you start cleaning uh, people's trash and you start you know, working from a small position up and you learn to build your character as a person. And I appreciate all that, even though at the time I didn't understand, but now I wish my children would experience what I went through. Can you describe a little bit about um, your life at school, like middle school, high school, um, and then how you eventually went into the legal field? Um, we stayed in Texas City, so my first school was there uh, in Texas City, and it was elementary school called Sims Elementary. Uh, the bus would pick this up, uh, uh, and I would be going to school, and at that time I would uh, be going with uh, my cousin, one of my cousins. He was 16 at the time. They put him in fifth grade, which is way too big for him. But he didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any English. Uh, so, you know, in a way, there was two of us, and they decided that he was too old for elementary because kids were so afraid of him. And actually, I was kind of happy he was there because he's kind of my bodyguard. Uh, kids was picking on me. I was being bullied, you know, like every other kid. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, they would find a way to trip you and trying to put their legs out to trip you or find a, uh, get you to, uh, into a fight. Uh, the, the school at that time had a lot of sport like football, and, you know, I didn't know what football was. I didn't know what baseball was. Okay, math was my core subject because I ace in math. Uh, I was so good in math that I, I guess I was probably about two level grade ahead of some of the other students because, you know, back in when I was in Vietnam, we already studied multiplication when we were in second grade. Here I am in fourth grade and I'm still studying addition. So to me, it's that is nothing. Uh, so math was my main subject. Uh, English and, and other course, on the other hand, was something new. Uh, trying to learn, actually, I didn't remember much. We I probably didn't understand what the teacher was saying, but they took us in, and then you know we learned from that. Um, after my cousin uh, uh, basically got kicked out of school, it's too big. They moved him up to junior high, so he left. So I had to deal with all this bully problem, and one of my solution was uh, that time Bruce Lee was in. Bruce Lee was the movie. Uh, of 1975, uh, 1976, 1977, so it was all Bruce Lee. So all the uh, black kids, especially the black kids, I don't know why, they just love Bruce Lee. So if they see you as Asian, you must have know how martial art or kung fu. So I used that to my advantage. Uh, they would come and say, do you know karate or you would know kung fu? I say, yeah, sure I do, I do. And, and you know, they would try to pick a fight on me and then I would say, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to fight you because if I fight you, I'll beat you up. I don't want to do that. And they would say, okay, we'll meet at the end of the day at school. And then I said, sure thing. So I told them the place. I told them uh, where I'm going to meet. And they said, oh, let's meet at the park. I said, you got it. Let's meet at the park. And then I don't know if they show up or not. I never did. I'll be stupid to show up. So next day, I come to school and they would say, uh, um, well, I was there. Where were you? And I said, where were you? I was there. I was waiting for you two hours. Where were you? And then, you know, they would respond and say, yeah, we're waiting too. And I asked them, well, where were you? Then they said, oh, we're over here near the tennis court. And I said, man, I told you it's at the other corner. So that's my way of getting out of the bully. It's basically to find excuse and reason to get out. Uh, so my memory of elementary school is basically how to deal with some of those bully. But luckily, I didn't get into any fight. I didn't get beat up. Um, went to junior high there too at Texas City. Um, different experience. Uh, the kids was much better. Uh, uh, I had two best friends. One was white and one was uh, black. So, uh, so for me, it was a different uh, culture to learn, a different aspect of different people. Uh, couldn't remember their name now, even though they was my best friend back then. But I had a good time. Those are the, time, those are the two kids I spent around with during lunchtime. Uh, when we get to high school, my family was already in the grocery business. They, uh, they have bought and they have sold uh, business. And we make a living out of buying stores, building it up and selling store. So my dad was pretty good at that. But he bought a store up in Houston, so we had to move from Texas City up to Houston. When we arrived in Houston, I was already in high school. And 
the school I went to was Clay Creek High School. Um, it was a different atmosphere. There was some uh, Vietnamese there. There was probably about 20 of us there. Uh, we grew up together, we stayed together. We even created a Vietnamese uh, student association there. We even uh, do things together. So that was part of my, uh, basically my, um, um, uh, you know my, my my friendship with some of the uh, people from uh, Vietnam, uh, I learned. But the problem was by that time there was two clash of culture. One was coming in 1975. Uh, one came a little bit later. Uh, by that time you have two clash of culture, two body of student. One body of student follow the uh, the American uh, lifestyle. I don't know for whatever reason I was left in the dark because I still have that Vietnamese culture in me. Uh, but I came from 75. Most of my friends that came from 75, they, 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 they would speak English only. They would not listen to any Vietnamese music. They would wear, I don't know, back then it was New Wave, so their hair was was red, yellow, whatever color it was. They, uh, they would wear this long rope like uh, um, Boy George at that time, and uh, they were makeup. I didn't really understand why, but there was the culture back then. Uh, for whatever reason, I wasn't into that, and uh, uh, you know, I was still listening to Vietnamese music. And uh, uh, but the one thing is, they took me in because I came from '75. The second group was uh, was the group that came after '75. My guess would be probably about the in the. Nine, late night, late night, maybe early nineties or late eighties. Um, they seem to have their own group because they listen to Vietnamese music. They speak Vietnamese music and they hang around each other and they have all this culture about Vietnamese. So there's two clash of group. I was fortunate enough. I was right in the middle where I can work out with both of them. I can, I can blend in with the group that seventy five and I can understand the group that came later. So they took. Both group took me in, and I'm kind of like a middleman in between. And, and whenever we have the function, I'm the guy who's basically trying to put the two groups together so that they can have a maybe a culture, maybe a party together. Um, didn't understand at the time, but but I realized that I guess because uh, uh, I wasn't influenced too much of the American lifestyle because my family pretty much uh, it's all almost daily work in in, in uh, family life. So I didn't associate the culture outside of the family. But with that, I kept my core culture uh, with the family Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese uh, family and try to, you know, blending with the, my brother and sister. And we all sh share everything together now. Um, so after the uh, high school, uh, I went to uh, University of Houston. Most of the kid wants to go to UT. I know UT is the, the in thing, okay? Uh, I have the grade, I have the, uh, the SAT score to get into, but we just couldn't afford it. We can't, we just couldn't afford the, the luxury of sending, uh, you know, uh, going to UT. I have, you know, eight brothers and sisters in my family, and there's eight of us in the family. Uh, three of them uh, are already in college. I'm the fourth one. So forget about paying uh, a dormitory or expense uh, outside of Houston. So our only option left would be to be in U University of Houston. And I went to University of Houston for four years. Uh, stayed there, I was majoring in computer engineering. And I don't know why, I just love computer. And uh, after my uh, third years, uh, I decided that, that maybe law school was something I was interested in. Uh, at that time, my brother already finished his, uh, his college degree. He was an electrical engineer. My second brother was a chemical engineer. He also finished college. Uh, they one, the first one decided he wants to go back to med school. The second one decided he wants to go get his PhD in math, which he finished. He he finally finished his PhD in math, and then he went back and get his his uh, medical degree. Uh, I guess he wants to be a professional student or something. Well, he finally finished. Both of them are a medical doctor now. Uh, my other sister, they finished college and. Uh, the, the most one thing that really, you know, really I remember the most is the day that I graduated from law school. Uh, because I can tell that my father was most proud. 
that year, all three of us graduated at the same time. My, my brothers uh, was graduating medical school, and my second brother was, gra uh, was graduating uh, his PhD in math. And then I was graduating law school, so all three of us was uh, graduating with a, with a graduate degree. So he, I can tell he was the most proudest, the, that's probably the most proudest days of his life. And, and I think if I ask him now, he'd probably say the same thing. Uh, so my gift back to him was to get that degree, and I will always appreciate that uh, he pushes and drives us to study. Uh, I wish I had the same knowledge or same know-how to push my kids to, to do the same thing, but uh, I really appreciate what he had done for us. I mean, really pushed us to go, uh, you know, to get that, you know, the graduates to go to graduate school. So, uh, reason why I went to law school, maybe because my brother all went med school, and I just don't feel like following this stuff, so I decided law school was for me, and that's the reason. And uh, I have been practicing almost 17, 18 years now, uh, and my primary uh, profession in uh, field is uh, we handle a lot of business and bankruptcy and personal injury. That's pretty much it. Can you tell us a little bit about your family now, um, your kids, and how you want to, how you're trying to keep the Vietnamese um, culture and tradition? My family, uh, when we um, moved to Houston, um, <clears throat> at that time, I was finishing law school and then I, I graduated right afterward. Uh, we had a family meeting, and one of my, the things that my father wants the most was for us to stay together. And one of the things we decided was we're going to get a partial land, and uh, we're going to get a land, and we're going to build our house with all the family building on it. The trick of being is to how are you going to be able to build that many houses on one lot of land without getting into problem? Because we will have problems like every family. So at that time, uh, he went to me because he figured I'm the most logical person in the house. So he asked me, of what do I think about it? I said, that's a great idea. But we need to basically set it aside like as if it's a subdivision. So uh, we decided to go look for land. We looked for a partial land down in Pearland, Texas. And that's what he bought. He bought a 10-acre track. We bought a 10-acre track. And um, we would uh, basically uh, build a house and we'd plat and divide it out. And the first time that really hit me was, when we were drawing this plan out, and it, it, it was costly. At that time, it was very costly to really plat out the, 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 the partial because you had to bring in the, the uh, drainage and you had to bring in the water and all that. But we decided we're going to move forward with it. So we're going to cut that 10 acre into 10 lots, nine lots to be exact. That means one for my parents, my, my, my parents, and then eight lot left for one of us each. One lot left, one acre lot left would be uh, for the pond, for the kind of like a small lake. And that was our plan. We did a drawing, we, we, we drew it out, and then uh, we followed the step. But the one thing that came up was the name of the street, and uh, we get a chance to name our own street. And he went to me and he said, what should we name? Name something nice, maybe something like pine subdivision, or something that would sound like expensive. And then we sat for a while and I said, why don't we name it, you know, our last name? So that it'd be on the map. And, and then when you look at the map, you can see our last name there. And we will keep it as a heritage for, you know, for as long as this lot is, is going to be here. And this is an opportunity for us to put our name on the map. So that was our decision. So right now, I'm living on Bui Drive, which is my sh last name. So my my brother and sister are all living on Bui Drive. Uh, there is quirks to it. I mean, when you live close enough, it it tends to have problems sometimes. But in all, the advantage is, is more than the disadvantage. Uh, we all have our separate house. The only thing is that if I walk down the street, I can borrow the sugar from my, 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 my sister. Like a couple of days ago, I was missing some uh, some ingredient to cook, and I went over to my sister and I said, "Can I borrow some?" And sure enough, she get it. I'm not gonna return it though, but it's mine now. But that's the advantage of living next to each other. And then the second thing is, your parents is close enough that you can visit them uh, anytime. My grandmother's living there now too, 
So uh, every time I pull out my driver's license, it would say, Bui Drive. And then they would say, oh, you get the street all in your name. And then when you tap up on your map, uh, maybe Google, you see your name, you know, your last name there. So that's one of the proud achievements that I think my father was very, very pleased with. And to this day, he has always been pleased that he able to get that land to be basically named after our last name and also be able all the families live near each other. Uh, but that's where we reside now, and uh, as far as, as uh, going to work, it's a little bit long drive, but being the family all together, it makes wonderful. I mean, I can leave the house without locking in these days, which is a rarity. Uh, not have to worry, because if I left my garage open, my, my sister would call and your garage open. So things like that, you will miss it. Uh, uh, in the old days, we can leave our door unlocked. Now I still can do it, uh, despite of all the crimes and stuff like that without not have to worry that if I forget to close the door or, or if I forget uh, uh, to uh, you know, close the garage. And recently, one of the things happened was I, I, I went over to my sister's house, which is across the street from me, okay? I went over to her house and her door was unlocked. She wasn't home, all right? And then she would cook this pot of, 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 of pho noodle on the stove. And being me, I, I'm, I'm very you know, comical, so I would take her pot and I would hit it under one of her, her dining table. And she would come home and she said, what happened to my pot? <laughs> Those are the things that you get, you, you, you get to do when you live near each other. And, and it, it's, it's, it's one of the fun moments part of my life, to be able to live around my sister and enjoy those things. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have, or your sisters and brothers have children yet, but for the upcoming generation, what are your hopes for them? My brother and sister, they uh, already have kids already. We, uh, you know, we already, uh, all of us are married. Uh, I have three, uh, three children. Two of them are boys, and one of them is a girl, my precious little girl. She's 10 years old. Um, we try to teach them uh, the culture, but it's hard because they grew up here. They speak English. Uh, Vietnamese become a second language. It's not a first language anymore. Uh, so English is the primary language, which is OK. Uh, but they don't, they don't understand the, the, the hardship we went through. I keep trying to explain to them that uh, we start from scratch. Even though I was born in 67, but 1975 was the starting point of my life because really we start with zero when we came over here. Nothing in our pocket. So every time that something happened in my life, and even till today when I speak with uh, a lot of my clients, they would be down because of their problem, because of their business going down, or because they're going to bankruptcy, whatever reason, I would always remind them, look, 1975, we have nothing. We came over here empty-handed. And if people think that we brought gold or money along with us, they are crazy because we don't have a single dime in our pocket. Okay, So to start at that point, then you realize how important it is to understand that, you know, appreciate what you have and don't be despair if you are at a low point in your life. My three kids, I always try to teach them that. Uh, my eldest is in high school now. Um, and my second one is in uh, seventh grade, and my younger is in uh, fifth grade. Uh, I try to put them into a small school because I want them to be, have a small, uh, without being influenced by a lot of the, the big uh, high school, the big uh, uh, junior high. But as far as the three children, um, they're also taking Vietnamese cl uh, uh, class uh, to learn Vietnamese. and. Uh, Hopefully they can, I, I don't think they can speak as well as I do, but hopefully they can at least understand and, and you know, one of these days I hope I can take them back to Vietnam and I hope that maybe they can at least see the culture and, and understand that this is where their parents come from. My parents raised me uh, uh, as a Vietnamese and I will always first be a Vietnamese, even despite that I adopt this culture and I adopt the, uh, the, the, uh, the living lifestyle here, but inherently, that culture is, is there where it, it's a symbolic of how you should respect your elders. And one of the things that's missing from the, uh, I would say the first generation here, because they were born here, is that they lack the understanding of respect of, uh, of elders. Uh, and I try to teach that with my children, so every time they see my grandmother or my uh, parents, which is their grandmother, the first thing they have to do is give them the respect. And hopefully that would rub off on them to understand that uh, they need to appreciate their elders so that you know every time they see them, they, they, they give them the respect back so that uh, that's part of inherent in our culture. And that's what's lacking in this first generation. 
in looking at all the different gaps in the generation, one of the things I noticed through my experience, my practice, is that generation gaps leads to different personality and different way they see the cultures. You get the first generation uh, who's basically trying to adopt and basically become part of uh, American society. So they really are American. The second generation, they're going to lose some of those value. And you can see that by looking at history. Like the Chinese, when they came over, their first job was grocery store, just like us, like the Vietnamese. Their first generation become doctor, lawyers, and, and, and professional. Their third generation, you know, they lack, and then they become Americanized. That's what I'm going to expect, you know, the Vietnamese culture is going to proceed in that direction because all the culture is tend to lead to that direction. But hopefully, if the family is, 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 is close enough, they can at least bring some of the culture and rub off some of these culture. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and leave the bad one aside, but bring the good culture in so that it's there. Uh, and I hope that I can bring that to my uh, children. Uh, Hopefully they push them enough, maybe they become doctors or lawyers, whatever, but, uh, you know, that's later on. But for now, uh, that's part of raising up, is trying to teach them that education is really the core of our, uh, our society. And, and if they can learn from that and learn from the experience that we came over here with nothing, then you need to start to really try to use education as your advantage in this society and hopefully they understand that and I try to instill in that in them every day you know when I take them to school and, and, and hopefully that rub off but that's what separates us from a lot of different uh, ethnic, uh, ethnics is because we tend to be basically uh, pushed toward education and hopefully the first and the second generation is the same. Do you want to share anything else that we haven't covered like um, life in Vietnam maybe before uh, I don't know how much you remember, but before um, April 1975? One of the things uh, that I would like to share is what I was gift and blessed with in, in what I've been through and what I have been seen through the eyes of some of my clients and some of the community work that I've done. Uh, the one thing uh, is that I learned to appreciate is to be humble and to be able to understand that I got to this point in life, become professional, because I was given uh, by chance and by basically by a gift from my parents. Not because I'm better than anybody else or not because I'm better than another uh, human being, but it was given a chance where my parents worked hard enough to let me allow me to go to school and finish and graduate and go to professional school. So for that, I have my parents to think about. But from the experience I learned, uh, each day is an experience in my life. Each time a client walks in the office, three things come to mind. Number one, their condition or their problem was not because they created it. It's because number one, either they lack the understanding or number two, because they're in desperate situation by circumstances. The second thing is that when they come in here, they are people, and you got to respect them as people. You take them in there to help them as people, and they came there to seek your help, okay? Not just merely because they pay you, that's why you help them, but you help them because they are people. And number three, you are given the gift and opportunity to study, and to graduate, and to become what you are, which is a professional. And you are given that gift to basically to help people. Then you need to use that gift to help them. Don't count the dollars and the cents in helping them because that is just a side effect. So that's just part of the result. What you need to look at is be able to help them because they came there to help you. And that's what being humble. And that is because, number one, I came in 75 with nothing. Uh, with a family that doesn't have anything. My, my, my father wasn't one that able to bring any money over, so we came with empty handed. Number two, my, my, my family and my parents instilled in me to work hard to be able to, 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 to help people and to be able to, uh, to uh, at least to be able to be beneficial to society. And number three is to keep the humbleness and the religion in you so that you, when, whatever you do, if you're humble and honest enough, the one thing that's lacking in, in, in our society these days is the honesty is lacking. 
and the humbleness is lacking. Therefore, you don't, if you want to build your business around it, if you can just be honest, work will come, people will come, and the honesty is there, you will always have a job. Even though you don't make as much, but you will always have a job. No different, and I always compare myself to uh, a blue collar worker like a mechanic. I'm no different from them. My only difference is I have an education. My only difference is I have, the, uh, I have a chance to go to college and finish law school. But I'm the same. If they can only be honest in the customer in fixing cars or fixing repair works, and if I can only be honest in the same direction, then the customer base for them is the same as my customer base are coming in as for help. And that is the foundation of my work, is if to lay the humbleness and to be honest enough, I will always have to climb. I may not be rich, I may not be happy, but I think with my sense of satisfaction in life, I am more wealthy than any other person would ever imagine. The money is there. I am more than uh, above average, uh, but you know I'm satisfied with what I have in life, and to appreciate that uh, is really to be humble and to understand. Uh, recently, uh, I had a chance to go back to Vietnam, and um, I haven't been back there, and I can only remember a vague memory of what happened on that April 1975. I remember vaguely my street, I remember vaguely my school, uh, and I remember running around the street, and I remember that every time the principal would drive down the street, we would all be hiding because the next day if she sees us on the street, that means we haven't been studying, she would spank us. So I remember all that. So the day when I landed on the airport of uh, Saigon, um, I cried. I literally cried. I cried because I realized that I'm home. Uh, it's my culture, it's my family, it's, even though my family is here uh, in the U.S. already, but it's home. As I walk down the street and I see, I can hear, you know, people cussing at each other. And you know, you don't want to say it, but they cuss and they yell and they holler. But then all this sound vibrate in your ears that you recognize that these are all Vietnamese language. These are all the things that, that you want to hear. The, 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 the sound of, 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 you know, of Vietnamese, the sound of, of my own people. So to land on, on Vietnam for the first time was an experience that really captivated me as far as being Vietnamese. And as I walked down my old street, I realized it was not as big as I imagined it'd be. It probably fit one car, maybe. Uh, I probably can run from one street to the other street probably in a short time. The school was so small, I would never imagine being that small. But just to hear the sound of of, of uh, the streetcar, hear the sound of people at the market screaming, yelling at each other. It's a lifetime experience that I, I am so glad and so happy that I went back. My second time I went back wasn't that much uh, impact as the first time, but then it's still there. I always appreciate the children uh, on the street begging. I always uh, appreciate the, uh, you know, the different culture. I remember the first time I promised myself if I ever come back, you know, if I see somebody that I put on a communist hat, I'm not going to give them a dime. I'm not going to give them a single penny, even at the back for me. And guess what? The first person that came back me was an old man with his, I guess, his grandchild on his back. And he came and begged me money, and he said, can I have some money? And what's on his hat was a communist hat. And I thought to myself, I said, look, he's human. So that was my answer to all the problems. I just have to let it go. So for me, uh, to go back and to really experience that is part of something, a learning process for me to become a human being and to understand what others are being through. And I always appreciate uh, the gift that the American had given me, the opportunity to study here, the opportunity my parents brought me over here, and learn to appreciate that. And one thing I don't like and I hate the most is that you have an opportunity, and I keep telling that to my children, you have an opportunity and a chance to go to school, to be better of yourself, and you don't take that opportunity and that chance, then you miss out on the whole perspective of what people are giving you and society is giving you. And here you are, your parents are affording you the opportunity to go to school, and you don't complete, and you, you waste, then it really is a waste of life. But 
I, hopefully I can instill that in some of my children. Um, have any of your brothers and sisters or your parents gone back to Vietnam and what were their experiences? I don't know how they experience as far as some of my brothers and sisters. They went back, uh, they really enjoy it. Uh, I don't know if they cry the first time. When I talk with a lot of my clients for the first time, some of them said that they, they did cry. Uh, uh, I know I'm a man, seeing crying or anything, but that's part of human nature. Uh, but to experience that, I don't know if they ever did experience I do. I guess my sense of focus as far as life and society's different perspective, because I appreciate it more and I learned to appreciate people. I really learned to learn a lot from listening to people, especially the elders that come into my office and tell me all these war stories and all the reason why all these communists are being hated and all the trouble they went through, all the concentration camp they've been through. And you learn to thank them and you learn to appreciate that what they've been through is to give you the, the gift of being here today. And America has given us the opportunity and the blessing for us to be here. No other country in this whole entire world has the opportunity to immigrate that many people into the U.S. as much as Vietnam. And the second thing is that if we were able to stay in Vietnam, my chance of going to uh, uh, school here in the U.S. would be zilt. We can't afford it, we can't pay for it, and we don't have the connection enough to go over here. And here's an opportunity that probably almost one-third of the country were able to afford the opportunity to come here to the U.S. and did not take that opportunity to what they was given, which is education. Then it's really uh, something that you know you should be frowned upon. But that is something that I learned to appreciate because if you look back, you can see that no other country has immigrated so much in a short period of time and allow an opportunity to go to school and to learn so much. And all the grandkids are able to go to colleges and university. And here we are sitting here not even thinking about that and wondering, you know, why are we basically kicking out of the country? Then appreciate what we learn and bring it back to our country and our culture so hopefully we can learn. And I hope that all these uh, young students, the foreign students that come over, and I can understand that the reason they still support the communist country is because not because they like it, it's because they lack the understanding because it wasn't taught over there. So hopefully bring them in and teach them and, and, and show them what it meant to be free and what it is to be free. And hopefully they can bring it back to our own country and, and, and you know, start the culture. I literally was so sad when I heard that part of Vietnam was given to China and that was something that really bothers me because for me that was almost like a gift from mother handed down to generation and now we're giving back to China and I don't understand why but there's no way to control it and there's nothing much we can do about it. Uh, so learn to adopt this country, what we have now. And, and hopefully we can raise our children here and raise the kids here so that they can don't lose the culture because it's really what makes it better. If we lose this Vietnamese culture, then we lost everything. We lost our, inher our inheritance, what's given to us. We lost our meaning of what it is to be uh, a Vietnamese. And I hope that my children will never lose and I hope that their grandkids will never lose that. But we do what we best we can and uh, always remember that my forefather and my great-grandfather are all from Vietnam. And that's why it's important, if we can, to take the opportunity to take them back to Vietnam and see what it is. Do you still have any relatives that are still living in Vietnam right now? Uh, all my relatives already immigrated over. <clears throat> um, my parents uh, are here, my grandparents are here. Uh, my grandfather died over there already, so uh, uh, except for a few cousins, I don't have any other relatives over there. <laughs> I think Curtin. Yeah, that's a bit.